Hi there, friends. I'm Vasco. I'm part of the team behind the first global Scrum Master Summit. If you're a Scrum Master, the Scrum Master Summit is a place to learn, to share, and to meet new friends. We will have lots of live sessions where you can meet and network with other Scrum Masters from all over the globe. So make sure you check it at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit and the numeral 21. That's bit.ly forward slash SMSUMMIT21. We have seven amazing keynotes or more as we are still organizing the conference as I record this and eight tracks that feature people like you and thought leaders sharing their insights and knowledge to help you become an awesome Scrum Master. So once again, check it out at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit 21. That's all lowercase, all one word, SM Summit and the numeral 21. I'll see you on the virtual conference floor. All right, now on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our TGIF episode, the Friday and Product Owner episode this week with Philip Rogers. Hi, Philip. Welcome back. Hey, thank you. It's glad glad to be here on a Friday. Absolutely. It is TGIF for sure. Uh, we are recording this on a Wednesday, so uh, just a little <laughs> bit of that, you know, imagining a Friday is already making me feel more energized. So uh, Hang let- ahead. <laughs> so let, let's talk about product owner. Uh, we'll talk about a great product owner a, at mm-hmm. the end so that we end up on a high. But first, let's focus on, uh, Philip, what might have been potentially the worst product owner anti-pattern you've ever uh, worked with. Yeah, this is, uh, this is certainly an area that, uh, that gets a lot of time and attention in blog posts and books and all sorts of things. And it's easy to see why, because, uh, you know, you do typically see quite a spectrum of uh, patterns and anti-patterns when it comes to what what does product management even look like what is you know what does this entail I I think there's a lot of confusion about is it a job is it a role is it a title I mean all that kind of stuff you know there's there's a lot to unpack but if I were to pick uh, one thing that I think probably is among the most common of the anti-patterns across many many teams it would probably be something as simple as how how does the product owner approach the work when it comes to how to manage the backlog? And so specifically, unfortunately, I think a lot of people have it in their head that it's solely the product owner's responsibility to write everything that goes in the backlog. I, I just think that's really unfortunate. I think, I think there's a lot of reasons for why, why that you know, idea is out there, but I think it's, it's counterproductive because you know, first of all, nobody knows everything. So even though even though the product owner, you know, is supposed to be a business domain expert and so on and so forth, there's no way they can know everything. That's why you have a team there. And so, you know, it's I think it's perfectly fine if the product owner kind of takes a first stab at writing things. That's no problem. But where it does become a problem is if, uh, you know, basically nothing is in the backlog unless it's in the exact words of the product owner, right? There's really no team input. It's basically all one way. And I think that can be become a huge, huge problem because, you know, get, again, the product owner is not going to know everything. And when it comes to uh, having some different ideas for how to approach things, the teams might have some great feedback on, uh, you know, let's say the, I don't know, the product owner, wants to build some widget. And so they're, you know, they're describing it. And they might, they might do a great job of actually describing the vision behind what they're trying to do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't an easier or better way to do it if you let the team kind of brainstorm a little bit, right? Instead of just saying, here's the backlog, work on this, you know, have, you know, have more of a grooming or backlog refinement type of conversation where you say, this is my idea. These are you know, some user stories that I have, how do these look and make it more of a conversation instead of a one-way thing. How do you do that, Philip? I, 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 I'm I totally with you uh, in, in what you said, that that conversation needs to happen. But of course, for us as Scrum Masters, the challenge is how do we facilitate that? Mm-hmm. So how do you do that? How do you bring the, the product owners you work with to start that conversation rather than uh, sometimes uh, heroically uh, taking the sole responsibility of managing the backlog. So I think uh, I think one of the better places to start is to see if you can find a trusted partner 
to work with the product owner. And sometimes they're right there in plain sight. Sometimes they're not. Uh, so I think in a lot of cases, depending on the team context, again, we could, you know, we could probably debate titles and stuff, but, but what a lot, a lot of time, what a lot of teams have as, as a team member, or maybe even more than one is someone like a business analyst. Uh, and so, um, oftentimes the business analyst also happens to be kind of a product owner in training. If you look at sort of the career path, right? So a lot of times, if, you know, if you do have a business analyst or more than one on the team, they're often being groomed to be scrum masters or product owners or something anyway. Um, and so they also tend to be pretty heavily involved with the customer facing conversations that occur, you know, and also all sorts of testing, you know, UAT, et cetera. And so it, it actually would be a problem if the product owner didn't have a good relation, working relationship with that person or persons in particular. So I think uh, that's a pretty good place to start to, uh, to kind of get to a place where the product owner feels like that's a true partnership. You know, they're really collaborating. And then once you've got that, I think you can move beyond that. And then maybe you can do something more like what, you know, some people use the term three amigos, um, you know, for, for conversations that happen in like a backlog refinement context, meaning that let's say it's a team of nine people. And so you have three groups of three and you let each little subgroup kind of go off and do some refinement on their own. And, you know, if it's, if it's like a, a fairly standard team, maybe you have, uh, you know, one member of each group who's a developer and one member of each group who's a tester and maybe one member of each group who's a UX or design person or something like that. Um, and then, you you know, you have those little groups work together and then they come back, you know, to the whole team. Obviously, you can still get feedback. You know, maybe the product owner doesn't think everything they did was perfect, but you can talk through it. And, uh, you know, I think that's another opportunity to kind of get in the habit of collaborating more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at the Three Amigos ID, I'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, it's a, a great way to start that conversation uh, and uh, finding that trusted partner. I think that can be a great catalyst for conversation. And also the fact that it starts to nudge the product owner to work on the stories together with mm -hmm. someone rather than alone, because that's also yep. one of the, the dangers that I see sometimes product owners really want to do heroic contributions and yes. go off and, and work alone on the stories for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and of course, then are disheartened when they present the stories and nobody <laughs> understands what they mean <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because you work on them alone, of course. And oh, yeah, the air, air goes right out of the balloon at that point. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but of course, I mean, they do it out of good intentions. It's they just do. not a very effective way to create the backlog because it, it leads to a lot of confusion and misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. Right. So now, Philip, we turn our attention to the opposite, the mirror image of what we just uh, described, what might have been potentially the best product owner that you've ever worked with. What were they like? Yeah, I, you know, I think... Um... I think a good place to start with this is empathy, you know, so, you know, certainly that applies to scrum masters in a big way, but also it's product owners as well, you know, really starting from a place of empathy, right? So, and that, that can look a lot of different ways, but I, I think when you get right down to it, um, you know, a team is going to notice pretty quickly uh, if and when uh, a product owner has empathy, meaning, they want to have an open conversation. You know, it's not like this one-way thing we were talking about. They really want it to be two-way. They want it to be a collaboration. They really want it to be the best possible product. And I think the best product owners realize that that doesn't happen if they're going it alone. That only happens if, you know, they're really, it's really collaborative and there's really this back and forth exchange of ideas and also complete honesty, you know, because, because I think, uh, one of the biggest problems we have is expectation setting, right? You know, so I think product owners are probably under as much pressure as anybody when it comes to, we have to have this thing done by a certain time. And so, you know, that gets you into the whole dynamic with iron triangle and, you know, you can't, you can't have it both ways. Right. So, so just to kind of use the, you know, the schedule versus scope side of the conversation. So, 
again, I think the, the most effective product owners are really good at setting real, realistic expectations and basically saying, okay, we realize we have say this deadline. Okay, well, um, we also are gonna need some flexibility from you, the customer, from you, the stakeholders, meaning that, all right, well, we have this deadline, we're gonna, we're gonna hit that deadline, but you know, the big caveat is we may need to trim scope here and there because we're gonna discover things along the way. And so in, instead of this sort of watermelon status thing, right, where, you know, red on the, red on the ins inside, green on the outside, which is unfortunately kind of an uh, all too common, right? Where nobody wants to say anything that seems like it's bad news, right? Everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. Then you get to when you're supposed to release and all of a sudden it's on fire. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and do pe people really enjoy putting out those fires, but they don't even need to exist, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what have you seen? Like, so setting expectations, uh, you know, mm -hmm. definitely a great asset for a, a product owner if they can do that. But how do you see great product owners do that? Like, what are some of the approaches, techniques that they use to effectively and deliberately do the, that setting of expectations as you described? I think one of the things you, you tend to see a lot of is uh, closer to what people refer to as probabilistic forecasting. And so, you know, typically this would be a collaboration between the Scrum Master and the product owner, a close collaboration. And for anybody for whom maybe that term's a little bit unfamiliar, uh, so it's often probably the most common context for weather forecast, the weather forecast for probabilistic forecast, meaning that um, if we're talking about like a week from now or a month from now, our level of certainty is certainly much less about, you know, it's going to be sunny or, or not than it is for say tomorrow. And so, you know, basically what, what I think is important for people to realize with the uh, probabilistic forecasting is it, uh, it's a way to kind of plot, you know, take a close look at your data and say, all right, well, if we, this over here is probably the most optimistic. This over here is fairly pessimistic. And then we want to try somewhere in the middle. And so I think if uh, you get in the habit of having the conversation like that, where you say, look, if all the stars align perfectly, we can probably get you know scope X done. But chances are that's not going to happen. Probably we're going to get someone somewhat less done because the chances for us to actually achieve like more than we've ever achieved before on a continuing basis that's really not a, a smart strategy so let's let's be you know let's be let's be intelligent about this in terms of what do we feel is actually truly realistic and you know that whole expectation side of things and of course you can use burn ups and whatever else you want to use but i, I think those are, are really important tools yeah, absolutely. Having that language again, right? So if, if probabilistic forecasting gives us a language to talk about what's possible and what's not possible, and I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing that, Philip. Unfortunately, we're getting close to the end, but before we do go, Philip, where can we find out more about you and the work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, you can definitely visit my blog. And so I'll just give you the name of it. Uh, so And we'll it, put the link on the show notes for everybody to mm -hmm. find it, of course. So I recently rebranded it. So now the blog is called A Path Less Taken. It lives on Medium. And on the blog, uh, I do write about a great many of the topics we've talked about, as well as some we haven't, like leadership, uh, a little bit in more of the technical coaching domain, but uh, that's where you can find my my latest writing. Absolutely. And we'll put, put those links in the show notes so that people can easily find and connect and ask questions, interact with Philip for sure. Philip, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. Thank you. It's really been fun. I, I appreciate you hosting and facilitating this. One more week of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast is over. But there's a lot more we have to share. We have developed our own membership site where you find a community of active and engaged Scrum Masters. In this site, you get access to exclusive content and get to interact with us, your podcast hosts, as well as the best Scrum Masters in the world. Join us at scrummastertoolbox.com forward slash podcast and keep this podcast free of advertising. See you next week for one more week full of Scrum Master tips and tricks.
We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.